Hi, this is Jody Spizer from Loyola University Medical Center, and I wanted to welcome you to another one of our mini video tutorials for our online dermatopathology review. Today I will be discussing the acantholytic and blistering diseases differential diagnosis. A disclaimer just before we start, that you never want to make a diagnosis under the microscope without correlating it with what the clinical differential diagnosis is. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we will simply be discussing the characteristic histologic findings of these disease states. So starting out, um, whenever you get a case, you want to look at it from low power to establish what type of pattern that you're seeing. If you see an acantholytic pattern, meaning that there is separation of the epidermis within the epidermis, then you want to take a look at medium and high power view to see if there's any other distinguishing features. If you see keratinocyte atypia, you want to think of an acantholytic AK or an acantholytic squamous cell carcinoma. If you see acanthosis with a dilapidated brick wall appearance that has no involvement of hair follicles and a negative direct immunofluorescence, you would want to think of Haley-Haley disease. The dilapidated brick wall appearance simply refers to the fact that the acantholysis is happening at all layers of the epidermis, resembling a dilapidated brick wall. If you look at the case and the acantholysis seems to be um, localized to one specific layer of the epidermis, then you want to take a closer look. If you have involvement of the hair follicles or positive direct immunofluorescence in a net-like pattern with C3 or IgG, and a super basilar split, you would want to think of pemphigus vulgaris. A subcorneal split, you would want to think of pemphigus foliaceus. If you have this sort of local, like more localized clefting with a negative DIF but dyskeratosis, then you want to take a look at how much of the biopsy is involved. So how much of the epidermis in the biopsy is involved. If the involvement seems to be very diffuse or generalized, then you would want to think of more of a Darius disease. If it's just taking up a very small portion of the epidermis, it's very focal or very localized, then you would want to think of Grover's disease. And these two things under the microscope can look very similar, so it really has to do with you know, both the clinical appearance and then under the microscope, the extent of the disease. If you see a solitary lesion that's cup-shaped and localized around a follicle, you would want to think of a warty disc keratoma. And if you have viral cytopathic changes, you would want to think of a herpes simplex virus infection. If you look at the slide on low power and you decide that the pattern is subepidermal, then you want to take a look at medium and high power view. If you see a posse cellular um, lesion, meaning there's not a lot of inflammation there, along with a positive linear IgG and C3 on direct immunofluorescence and a positive split skin immunofluorescence localizing to the floor, you would want to think of EBA. If you see caterpillar bodies and hyalinized dermal blood vessels, you would want to think of a porphyria cutanea tarda. If you see a subepidermal cleft with eosinophils, along with ancillary studies like a positive linear IgG and C3 on direct immunofluorescence, as well as a positive split skin immunofluorescence localized to the roof, you would want to think of a bolus pemphigoid. If you have a subepidermal split with papillary dermal abscesses, and granular IgA that's localizing to the, papilla, the papillary dermis on DIF, you would want to think of a dermatitis herpetiformis. If you have a subepidermal cleft with neutrophils that may or may not be um, solely papillary in the papillary dermis and within abscesses, but then you have a linear IgA pattern on direct immunofluorescence, you would want to think of linear IgA disease. And then if you have a subepidermal cleft and then accompanied by a full thickness epidermal uh, necrosis, then you want to think of a toxic epidermal necrolysis. So let's use some of these simple clues to take a look at some of the online cases and see if we can come up with the diagnoses. So first and foremost, on low power view, we see that we have an ulcerated lesion with cells that are originating from the epidermis and expanding out into the dermis. We can see that within these cells, you have areas of acantholysis, which is highlighted by these white areas, because you can see the slide underneath it. Um, on high power view, what we can see is not only the acantholytic areas, but we can see that these cells are very typical. 
So atypical cells, atypical keratinocytes coming off the epidermis into the dermis with acanth lysis would give us a diagnosis of an acanthlytic squamous cell carcinoma. Now, although this lesion isn't necessarily the first thing considered under the acantholytic uh, differential, it is something that can look similar, so we wanted to include it. So from low power view, what we can see is it's an intraepidermal process. You have serum deposition, and then you have a superficial and deep mixed inflammatory infiltrate. And this is really the key take home point is that you have the superficial and deep component. This is just a high power view showing the intraepidermal uh, serum deposition spongiosis and then um, you can see the superficial dermal inflammation and then the deep uh, dermal inflammation here and this would be characteristic of a bolus arthropod reaction. Our next case is very classic. From low power view we can see that this is a subepidermal split meaning that the epidermis and the dermis are split and when we go down and we look at you know, a higher power view, what we can see are all these granular red cells within this in inflammatory infiltrate, and those are eosinophils. So if we have subepidermal clefting with eosinophils, we think of bolus pemphigoid. Obviously, in this case, we would generally have a direct immunofluorescence, which would show a positive linear deposition of IgG and C3. Our next case, what we see is an intraepidermal vesicle. And within this, we can see uh, acantholytic cells, but they look a little bit different than normal keratinocytes, and that's because they have viral cytopathic change. Viral, viral cytopathic change is represented by the, what we call the three M's of herpes, which is multinucleation, just meaning just that, that the cells uh, can have multiple nuclei margination of the chromatin, meaning that the chromatin is pushed to the edge of the nucleus so that the center of the nucleus has this sort of clear glassy appearance and then the outside, the, the periphery of the nucleus actually has this dark outline and then molding, meaning that the nuclei kind of hug each other um, within these multinucleated cells. And when you see these types of changes you would think of a herpes virus infection. So remember that the three M's of herpes virus. Our next case, we can see two things that are a little unusual. Um, the first thing is that we're on a, a mucous membrane, and the reason that we know that is because we're not seeing a, a very prominent corneal layer. And then we can also see that we have some mucus glands down here. So um, we, can, we can see that we're on um, a mucosal surface. Um, what we can also see is that there is a split here, and it's localized and then we can see that on higher power it's localized to a supra basilar location so we have these keratinocytes, the basal layer keratinocytes lining the bottom in a tombstoning pattern um, and this is very characteristic of pemphigus vulgaris. Generally we would also have an associated positive DIF um, in a net-like pattern for C3 and IgG. The next case from low power, what we see once again is a subepidermal split between the dermis and the epidermis. And what we see here is, is it's really lacking inflammatory cells. It's very clean. Um, on a higher power view, what we can see is caterpillar bodies, which are basically remnants of dead keratinocytes um, that are kind of sticking to the roof of the blister. And then on high power view, we can see these hyalinized dermal blood vessels. I do strongly encourage you to go to the online um, review as well. Uh, you will have access to annotated slides after you take the exam on, and with those slides you can look at these from much higher power. The next case is very characteristic. Once again we're seeing a sub epidermal split and what we're seeing is that the epidermis looks very pink. Usually on H&E stains what we see is a purple epidermis. The viable uh, keratinocytes look purple on the H&E stain, but what we're seeing here a more of a medium power view is that all the cells um, are pink and that means that this is actually a uh, a full thickness necrosis of the epidermal layer. So these things taken together would give you a toxic epidermal necrolysis. Our last case, what we're seeing is a solitary cup-shaped lesion that has these dyskeratotic cells. 
Here we can see them on a higher power view. These are the core rons and core grains, the rons being the round ones, the grains being more um, linear ones that look like grains. Um, now, a similar histologic appearance on low power, um, excuse me, on high power, could be seen in dairy disease and Grover's disease. But based on the fact that this is a single solitary lesion and this characteristic cup-shaped feature would give us an inclination even under the microscope that this is a warty dyskeratoma. So this is the last case that we're going to discuss within this differential diagnosis. I hope that these simple clues are easy to apply and will um, lead you to the right diagnosis when you're looking at your derm path cases. Once again, I highly recommend that you check out the digital slides on the online uh, derm path review so that you can review them at your leisure and at whatever power um, makes you comfortable to get the histologic features ingrained. Um, thank you for participating.